So, uh, so I'm Scott Chamberlain. Those are my Twitter handles, uh, my orchid there if you want to look me up. Um, and some of this is funded by uh, Sloan Foundation. Uh, again, here's a link to my talk. It's just slightly different from yesterday. There's a talk on the end instead of tech. Um, and again, it's CC by. So uh, we're going to start off with Doge, like any good talk should. Uh, infrastructure is awesome, uh, and we want to do we want to build great things on top of that. Um, so let's talk specifically about infrastructure and science. Um, so I think infrastructure specifically. We're all here to talk about what Crossref is doing. The infrastructure they build uh, is a necessary building block for awesome science. And I define awesome science as reproducible science, open science, and I think uh, it necessitates programmatic science. Um, so so I, I want to sort of drive home that we have a huge opportunity to make science better, uh, building on the infrastructure that Crossref builds, that DataSide builds, ORCID is building, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I do have some critiques of the system, uh, but I want to keep in mind that it's, it's only to make the whole system better. So I'm going to talk about a few stories, uh, use cases, talk about what infrastructure enables, i.e. what my group does, uh, and things that could be better. So some stories first. Um, so I, have a, I think I have five examples here. I'm going to, we're, we're not interested in the p-values and all that. We're just sort of interested in the questions people are asking. Uh, because it will give you an idea of what people could potentially do with maybe data that Crossref is providing. So this, this researcher was asking, um, this is their author inflation in, um, in, um, in uh, articles through time. So the, the question is like, uh, is the average number of articles per author increased through time in these, in these PLOS and PLOS journals? And each panel is a different PLOS journal. Uh, and you know some of them don't show much of a pattern. Some of them do. Plus biology, plus medicine, uh, have a somewhat increase in time of author number of authors per per paper. And so this is just a good example of what you could do with this. Doesn't even need uh, full text. You could just get uh, metadata. Uh, and this this happened to be through the Plus Search API through our an R client that we maintain. Uh, but you could do the same kind of thing with Crossref metadata. Uh, another question uh, researchers asked was, are the articles that, that talk about open science that are sort of about open science, uh, are they increasing through time? And these, these researchers did uh, manual searching of Web of Science and then uh, programmatic searching of PubMed. Uh, and the PubMed searching was through a, a client that we, uh, one of our community members maintains called Rentres, Ron, or Rentre, however you want to say it, uh, using the Entres uh, uh, web service. Uh, another use case, uh, this researcher was interest, interested in statistical reporting errors. Um, and this actually necessitates full text, so we can't just use uh, metadata. So this is an example of a, a whole suite of kinds of studies where um, they really need to have access to the full text. And, and, and in this case, PLOS provides that, as we all know. Um, so I'm not going to try and explain this figure. <laughs> this is just one of the many figures in the paper. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so that's an example of, of the PLOS R client again. Uh, and, I, and I pulled out some, uh, so, uh, this pair from the paragraph of the methods of this paper, uh, how they got data. So via EBSCOhost, we manually downloaded all, all articles in HTML from six journals. Furthermore, we manually downloaded all articles, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, finally, we automatically downloaded all HTML articles, um, et cetera, from PLOS with the R package that we maintain. So I, I can imagine you could easily guess that one of these ways is easier. One of them is less error prone. One of them is faster. <laughs> one of them is more reproducible. Um, and that's the automatic downloading, right? So um, hopefully, in these kinds of methods sections in the future, um, nobody will say I manually scanned or downloaded anything. Hopefully, it'll all be programmatic. Uh, uh, and this question was, do metadata predict uh, publication lag? So this is a case where they don't need full text. They could just use metadata, like the metadata that Crossref provides. Uh, this happened to be with, with uh, PLOS, um, PLOS Search API, but the same thing could happen with Crossref. Um, and so the, in this figure, they're showing some of the, some of the uh, estimated mean review days, so the time between when the paper submitted and the time when 
I th can't remember if it's when review is done or when papers uh, actually published, but but anyway, they found some patterns and et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think this is the last one. Um, uh, this this person this isn't a necessarily a paper, but I just found this um, scouring through GitHub repositories, uh, where they actually they use uh, we we maintain an R crossref client that I talked about a little bit yesterday, um, in the more tech talk, and they were interested in finding they had snippets of citations, so they had author year, uh, I think it was author year uh, publication uh, or journal name, and so then they could take that those those subset of a citation and go to the Crossref API, get the whole thing, including the DOI, and include that in their, in their whatever they, their research output is. Um, and these are a few um, questions that we've gotten personally uh, via various channels, email and, and Twitter and such. Uh, can I use an R Open Site package to retrieve all figures from a particular journal as individual files? So this is an example where um, I think, I'm not, I'm not totally up to speed on this, but I think a lot of the figures are maybe CC0 or sometimes, maybe there's CC BY, I can't remember. So this is an interesting use case where people just want to get the figures, they don't really want to get, maybe, maybe they don't even need the full text. Um, so that's something that would be interesting to support. Um, how, how do we retrieve a DOI from article metadata? Um, so the opposite of what our Crossref does, any ideas? Um, and so I think they have, you know, a bunch of metadata and they're trying to get the, I'm not sure what exactly they were trying to do, but I think we followed up and sorted it out for them. Um, does anyone know how to download article PubMed IDs from a list of authors? So this was something I think just asked yesterday and I tried to sort it out for them. So we take the authors, go to ORCID, um, find works that they've worked on and then go to Crossref. And uh, uh, and then I think, I think they're, was another uh, NCBI API involved in there as well. Um, so that's the that's the stories, the use cases. So um, now to uh, what infrastructure enables. So there's a there's a huge amount of open data, right? Um, we all we're all aware of this. That it's increasing all the time. Blah blah blah. Uh, and these are a few of the examples that that are out on the web that we personally work with. Uh, there's Dryad and Figshare for um, supplements um, to journal articles. Uh, GBIF is Global Biodiversity Information Facility, and they're one of the they're the biggest player in um, in species occurrence data, so records from field studies and museum records. Um, uh, there's Fishbase, which is probably one of the bigger repositories of, of sort of fish um, occurrence data and life history data, uh, taxonomic data. Uh, TreeBase for phylogenies, ITIS is a taxonomic uh, database. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot out there. Uh, but we aren't really trained to, to use it, right? I mean, there's increasingly people, hopefully people are all aware of software carpentry, data carpentry here, where they're sort of going into to a lot of uh, universities and training grad students to do basic programming, and hopefully they'll, they'll, they'll keep programming throughout their, their career. Um, so this is, it's getting better, but we're, there's, they're still not, they're still not uh, up to speed on, on how to actually leverage this this data, and sometimes it's very big data. Um, and so, what, so what we need are uh, programmatic tools um, uh, to to leverage this this data. Uh, so what's needed? So we need uh, we need tools. We need a whole bunch of different kinds of tools. Not exactly these tools. This is obviously a metaphor. Um, so specifically, I think we need programmatic tools, uh, and I'll repeat the assertion I did yesterday that I think all science should be done programmatically. Um, UIs and, and, a, and you know website UIs are great. I think they're good for exploration, but I think in the end, the workflow that's associated with the research paper should be written in code. And so what enables this is uh, APIs, application programming interfaces. We have all, I think we're all up to speed on this from the workshop uh, that Carl led yesterday on the Crossref. Uh, search API, um, so I don't think I need to explain that to this crowd. Uh, and so what APIs enable is uh, reproducibly plugging data from the web into research workflows. So um, what I'm talking about here is all that open data, a lot of them have uh, web services, some of them don't, but a lot of them do, and then we can create cro um, programmatic clients to let researchers query that data, fetch that data, and plug that into their, their research workflow. And so that's where we come in. Uh, our group is called uh, our OpenSci, 
And um, we're a sort of a nonprofit within UC Berkeley. We're funded by uh, the Sloan Foundation. So uh, it was honestly an ad hoc sort of conversation over Twitter and uh, blogs over in, in about 2010 is when we started. Uh, and then we finally got some funding. And uh, now there's a sort of worldwide community of developers slash researchers that, uh, that maintain software, use the software, et cetera. <laughs> And these are just a few of the people uh, on our website. Um, this is at arbonsite.org slash community. Um, and these are just, uh, you know, a lot of these people are academics that have their own research, uh, research careers, and they help maintain a, a, a client that they're really interested in. So I think this is part of our, what makes us successful is that we can have people that champion their, their tool and their discipline, and they can reach out to people in their, in their, uh, in their discipline to, to tell them about it. And so we make, we make software, that's what we do, uh, to facilitate, specifically to facilitate reproducible and open science. Uh, we focus on R. Uh, it's, um, if, if you're not familiar with R, it's, uh, it started as a sort of stats-focused uh, programming language, but it's very pretty general purpose now. Uh, it's not as, as general purpose as something like Python or, or Ruby, but um, it's pretty general purpose. Um, so a lot of the functionality that people use is outside of a core distribution of R. If you go and download R uh, from from their website, there's not there's a you know there's a lot there, but a lot of the functionality is in these these things we call packages or libraries. Uh, and currently, there's about 7,500 of them, and it's been growing rapidly as the community of, of R users is is also growing rapidly. Um, so R is widely used in academia. Uh, industry, government, uh, et cetera. Uh, I would say it's probably the most widely used language in a lot of disciplines in academia. Some disciplines don't really use it at all, but some a lot use it a lot. Um, there's um, there was a uh, this little poll of uh, or I guess it wasn't a poll it used LinkedIn uh, data and and what you know, people that self-identified as data scientists, which is uh, the new sort of hot thing. Uh, and the skills that they had were that one of the top things was R. So sorry, that's, that font is very small, but the top thing is data analysis, and then the second thing is R, and then Python, and then other things. So, so it's not just academia. It's, a lot, it's, it's highly valued in, in industry as well. So I, so I, I mentioned that because uh, it, that it's widely used because we're not focusing on some sort of crazy programming language that no one uses. It's, it's sort of widely used. Um, so, so data acquisition, uh, so sorry, I'll step back. This is the sort of workflow that, that I imagine um, researchers um, using. So they're, they're acquiring some data, they're doing some data manipulation, uh, analysis, and visualization, and that's sort of a circle, right? You're iterating on, on, your, on your process there. And then you're writing uh, the manuscript, and then you're publishing the paper. And then, uh, so our up inside, we largely focus on data acquisition. Um, and, 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 and by the way, this whole process, I think um, a lot of it can happen in R, and we hope that researchers who do all of this in R, or, if, or if Python, or whatever it is, whatever their tool is, do it all in one sort of tool chain so it's, it's easily reproducible. Um, so we focus on data acquisition, and then once, once users get data, let's say cross-ref data, for example, uh, they can easily then, within R, do their data manipulation, analysis, uh, visualization, uh, do their writing, and, uh, and there's great tools in R for writing as well, whether it's LaTeX or Markdown, and then publishing. Publishing is, we're, we're, uh, we have some tools around that where I'll talk a little bit about that, but that's one of the, the sore spots um, that really needs to be addressed, and I, th I think there's a lot, of, a lot of things we can do there to make it less painful. Um, so we have a whole bunch of packages. There, you could check out the link at uh, rpnsci.org slash packages. Uh, we have sort of, sort of thematic areas. Uh, we started in biology. We were all ecologists uh, at, when we started, so we have a lot, of, a lot of activity there. But we also have a bunch of stuff in literature. Uh, so, you know, the PLOS client I've talked about, the Crossref client. Uh, we have one for ORCID in development, uh, for the Entrez uh, web service. Uh, BMC is sort of stalled-ish as they sort of update their web services, um, archive, et cetera. Uh, and we have, like I said, we have a few tools around publishing, Figshare, uh, Zenodo. Um, 
Uh, we have some stuff around uh, history, uh, uh, archaeology, a little bit of archaeology, not much, and uh, some stuff around all metrics. So I'm going to talk about a few those, of those sort of thematic areas. I'm just going to talk about a few that I think are relevant to this, to this group. So the first is uh, text mining. Um, so don't, don't, don't fall asleep right away. Uh, I'm, I only have a few slides of code, and it's just a drill home. Uh, that it's super easy to do. Um, don't not to be afraid of, of writing a little bit of code. Um, so so here we're. This is the same example from yesterday, I think. Uh, so we load this full text package. This is an R. So if you're in the R uh, console, you install the package and then you load this package called full text. And then we ft score search and we search for the phrase ecology. I was an ecologist, so that's that's what I'm interested in. And then we, we want to search across uh, Entrez and Crossref. We could also add a bunch of other things, PLOS and BMC, et cetera. Uh, then we get back some result that says, hey, you search for ecology. Uh, there, we found 250,000 results in Crossref, 80,000 in Entrez, and we return 10 of each because you know, each one is, is, is rate, uh, not, is, does paging, right? So you only get a few back. Uh, and then we can drill into that in the, in the bottom panel there and get the results just for Entrez or just for Crossref, and then users can sort of slice and dice that as they like. Um, and another example, uh, this is the same example from yesterday, I believe. Uh, we searched for ecology, and this time we're getting back uh, the results of that, but then we're going with FT get, FT underscore get to actually get the full text. And that's all they need to do. They don't need to know how to uh, you know, figure out the URLs and then go download them and all that. This just figures out the logic for them. Um, it's obviously a lot easier for open access papers or papers that they have access to. Uh, and then we, and they get that object and they pull out, they just want to pull out permissions and they get permissions and everybody's happy. Um, so, so we're on the text mining subject. Uh, I talked yesterday and I won't go into detail about them now, but uh, we have Ruby, uh, which also includes a command line client uh, for doing, um, th these are sort of uh, low level um, and then Python uh, is sort of low-level cross-serve client as well, and JavaScript is not, ma not maintained by me, but I maintain those, those upper two, and then hopefully these, these low-level clients, um, they don't include a lot right now, but they um, will hopefully facilitate higher-level uh, programmatic clients for, for text mining. Um, so a little bit, a few thoughts about text mining so far. Um, authentication is kind of a problem. Uh, when we do need to do authentication, um, it's, it's, the, it's no, I don't blame anyone, but it's just a sort of painful process right now. Um, you know, as even I consider myself a somewhat technical person, and, and, and I try, and it's hard to figure out sort of what to do. Like, I know the, with the TDM uh, process that Crossref has, the, the publishers can provide a full text link and license, but I'm not an expert on licenses uh, myself, and I imagine most researchers aren't either. And so it's sort of hard to figure out well, what does the license mean, et cetera. Um, and then on the on on the, the URL side, to the URLs for the full text version, um, figuring out URLs is pretty painful if they're not already provided in the Crossref uh, Search API. Um, and so if you remember my slide from yesterday, the please 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 one that that insert that there. Um, so uh, PDF text extraction, it's not, maybe doesn't concern this crowd, but that's also a relatively hard problem. I mean, there's a bunch of tools around that in various languages and C libraries and this and that, um, but it's hard to make it really easy for people. So it, we're also working on, on that bit. Um, and then making text analysis simple. So once you have the, the full text, um, obviously people that text mine for their career, that's not something that's painful. but. We're really trying to bring that to people that are interested in doing it, maybe tangentially as part of their paper that they've done some field work on, for example. And so hopefully we can make that simple for people. Um, metadata. So this is just the, the second, I think this is the last code with uh, slide with code on it. Uh, here we're, this is, we're in R again. So we maintain a, a, a pretty mature client for, for R for the Crossref search API and, and their various other a few of their various other APIs. And so the first example, we want to get works funded by the NSF. So, so we use uh, CR Works, and we use the award funder. 
that number, <laughs> and then we get works back uh, that are funded by that, that particular funder. I think yeah, it's NSF. And then in the second example, we want to get works back from PeerJ, so we use their member ID. We say works equals true, and then we get the works back, and then we get back a, a nice data frame, uh, like a you know it's like a spreadsheet, and that's the most common thing that that researchers are working with, that our users are, are working with, and it's super easy to take that, that data frame and, and go do some downstream visualization and analysis. And the last example there I had from yesterday, uh, getting ORCIDs from work, so we say we use Crossref Search API uh, filters, so we say we, we only want works back that where the authors have ORCIDs uh, in their metadata, and then we can do a little bit of magic to get those ORCIDs out. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other clients uh, that we maintain dealing with, uh, with metadata. These are all in R. Um, there's prob there might be uh, clients in other languages out there. I'm not really sure. Um, so we work with uh, DPLA. Uh, they have a really nice set of, of web services um, for working with sort of their, um, their members, uh, libraries, and, and museums. Um, data site, so we have a client where we're working with uh, working with the, the nice data site API. Um, and I think that uh, it may be using cross ref search API in the future, but we'll see. Uh, we have a client for the ORCID web services, uh, so that's um, really nice. I mentioned uh, one of those three questions on that slide earlier in the use cases, uh, and it was really nice work together, cross ref um, and the ORCID APIs together to get, get work done. Uh, in Hathi Trust, we have a client for them. Uh, PLOS, I've mentioned a bunch of times, Entrez, uh, BMC Archive. And we have a general purpose OAI PMH client, if any of the OAI fans in the crowd want to want to play with that. Um, it's a nice client to, to sort of drill into any OAI PMH data. Um, so people have talked about debt a bunch here. So the, the, the Legato sort of installation for Crossref, um, Crossref products. And uh, so I, we've been working on, so the Legato software that Martin Fenner sort of spearheaded um, originally worked with uh, the PLOS corpus of, of works. And so we started uh, an R client, I don't know, years ago. I'm not remember sure when it started. Um, but so we have the R client, there's a Ruby client, and there's a Python client. I was just starting to fix the Ruby client today, so hopefully by tonight you guys should be able to, to try it out. If you get have a drink, you get back and play with the Ruby client, of course. Um, and then you can also play with the Python client. Uh, and then, so the great thing about Legato is you can you can swap in and out. Uh, you can go search the PLOS, uh, PLOS Legato instance or the Crossref uh, instance and, uh, it, it's, and do what you want with it. Um, so now on to publishing a little bit. Um, so we, we don't have a lot in publishing in our, in our sort of suite of, of tools. Um, but one of the interesting things that I think could be useful is uh, this thing called ecological metadata language. And the ecological part is not important. Just think metadata language. Uh, and it's a sort of, uh, it provides a schema and it's sort of XML data structure to specify um, uh, metadata around data sets. And so um, our colleague Carl Bodeger in the, 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 the picture on the right um, works on this, on this client. And it allows researchers to, let's say they have a data set that they're working with. They, they're going to publish a paper. They're going to upload a data set. And they can, this tool will allow them to automatically create metadata around the data set from within R. Um, they don't have to know anything about XML. And most researchers probably don't. Um, and then they can create this XML file. And then if there was an easy way, there isn't yet, <laughs> but hopefully we can make the, an easy way for them to upload that data uh, along with their paper. And then, we, as we know, that's great because then that would allow, um, allow data to be more reusable in the end, more discoverable, et cetera. Um, and write, another sort of publishing idea is write APIs. And so, um, so I think this is, um, I think some people yesterday talked about the sort of push model of debt where um, instead of going out and querying, um, you know, uh, Wikipedia is just going to push events when they see them on specific DOIs. And so it'd be great if, you know, if there's a publisher that has, uh, you know, an API, web services, and it's not just that we can read from their API, that we can also push to them. So if we generate metadata around a data set, let us push, you know, 
that data, that metadata, up to your to your database with you know authentication and, and, and et cetera. And then that, you know that could potentially make close the loop and make a, a complete reproducible workflow. Uh -huh. So uh, a few lessons and observations now. Um, so I've been working uh, a lot with the CrossRift Search API and um, specifically with sort of the, trying to work out the, the, the workflow when you work with full text links. Um, so one of, the first, one of the first observations that you notice, uh, that I noticed, is that there are very few links available. This is, so this is not, so there's 500, last time I checked, there was about 5,700 publishers uh, in CrossRef's database and less than 4% provide full text links. And this is not uh, of the total DOIs, this is just of, of the publishers. Uh, Percentage-wise, so um, of the of the full text links that are there, those are great, those are useful, but um, we have very few publishers sort of um, providing links. And I know that's getting better, um, but anyway, there's there's not much there yet. And if we if we take that same data set and we remove the zeros and we just have the uh, publishers that provide some links, at least more than zero, uh, then we have you know there's on the the right-hand side there, there's a pretty high number of publishers that have 100% coverage uh, for their for their DOIs, and a lot um, a lot of sort of variation around that. Um, another thing is uh, um, related to this sort of lack of, of full text links deposited is as a tool developer, I have to manually figure out uh, I have to manually construct URLs to full text links, and you know this isn't rocket science. Um, we can figure this out, but this leads to super fragile software, right? You know, if publisher A decides to change the base URL to their full text uh, version of the paper, um, how many publishers are there? I don't know, tens of thousands, I'm not sure, a lot. And so how am I supposed to keep up with that? So if, if it's all in one place, if the links are deposited into the Crossref uh, database and available through the API, I only have to go to one place to keep those up to date. Um, so this might be a little bit of out, of out of date, this data. I looked at some of the publishers that provide some of the, uh, that provide uh, some, at least some full text links, and then I sort of ran a bit of code to see, do these, do these full text links actually resolve? Are they, are they, do they, do they lead to something, or are they sort of, the, are they broken? And, uh, and I won't name any publishers, but the publisher IDs are there, so if you know publisher IDs, then, um, and I think 3.11 actually, is getting better, but uh, at one point they were zero, and there were a lot of them. So um, they are getting better. Uh, 276 was at about 80 percent. So there's a lot of them that 100 percent of them resolve, but that's obviously um, a big problem. Whether it's whether you want to call it link rot or maybe the links never worked, um, that's a big problem. And so we obviously want um, this. We want the green thing. We want links. We want. We don't want broken links. Um, and so this kind of thing is, creates a huge barrier to reproducibility and just pain. You know, it creates pain too. Not even if you're just, even if you don't care about reproducibility. If someone's trying to to um, do a little bit of text mining or get some metadata, it's gonna it's gonna int introduce pain into the process. Um, another thing is about documentation. I mean, I'm the first one that will admit that I I needed to better document my software. Uh, we all need to, but um, in the, in, the, in in this sort of lessons section, I'm not only talking about Crossref Search API. I'm talking about um, when we're we're thinking about text mining. Obviously, we can get full text links through the Crossref Search API, but then we need to go to the individual publisher website to get that full text. Or some of the uh, publishers have their own web services like Springer and Elsevier and Miley, and some of the bigger ones, uh, BMC, etc. Um, so, so as a developer, as a toolmaker, when there's great documentation, I get really excited about. Working on that tool. When there's not, I work on something else. Um, another another thing that would be great to see is making developers a first-class citizen on your landing page. So you've all probably heard of GitHub, and this is their footer on their website. At least they had a redesign recently, so it may not look quite like this. But uh, I wish it was on their header, but at least it's on their footer. And so if you can see on the right-hand side there, their status and then API. So. Uh, you know, it's on their on their landing page. Developers can easily find uh, their web services and create a tool, find a tool, et cetera. And so, I'd like to see all publishers that have web services 
um, doing this and sort of paying attention to, to developers. Um, supporting client libraries to work with your web services. So if you don't have any, no worries. <laughs> but if you do have some, uh, I would sort of reach out to the developers, uh, try and create a community, maybe prop up a, a, a discussion forum. Discourse is a really nice option. That's what we use for our, for our forum. Um, and uh, that could go a long way towards sort of having great clients to work with, uh, programmatic clients to work with your web services. Uh, auth should be easy. Uh, API keys and OAuth is plenty. Um, obviously, there's there's certain thing, other things that need to happen that uh, with with certain in certain cases. Um, but uh, but it would be nice if that was all we needed to deal with. <laughs> and uh, as a developer of a bunch of tools and a bunch of different languages, um, I'm probably going to be the person that a lot of researchers are going to come to asking, "Oh, this thing isn't working. It's broken." They're probably not going to go to the publisher and say, why isn't this th thing working? They're probably going to come to me, uh, and then I'm going to have to go dig around and try and find out what's going on. So um, the easier the process can be, the easier my life is, and the easier the researcher's life is. Uh, institutional access, uh, this is related to auth authorization. Um, this is still very painful. Um, and so it's a lot like this. So you know, you're trying to get access, and then it just meh, fall over. <laughs> And then we, but we really want it to be like this. We just want it to be smooth, awesome, um, you know, surfing behind a donkey on the road. Um, so we've got to make off easier. I know it's complicated. Um, I don't really know how to solve it. There's a lot of players in the game, libraries, institutions. They all have varying amounts of access. There's individuals, developers like me, creating the tools. And so it's a complicated process, but I hope, I hope it gets easier. Um, outside of Crossref's API, uh, it's kind of a mess, and I don't mean that as a negative thing. I just mean the heterogeneity introduces messiness. Um, so, the, you know, inside the Crossref search API, which is, is amazing, it's great. Uh, that's a, a single source of a lot of data that, that's easy to work with. But once we get into um, uh, other other things, it's it's hard to know. It's hard to create great tools around that because there's so much heterogeneity. Um, so some example questions. How do I know if my institution has access? Even as a developer, I had no idea. Like I talked to a few librarians, they got directed to a whole bunch of different ones, and then they still didn't know. Um, and uh, who do I talk to to get access? Is there something in the Crossref Search API we can include to, to, uh, to help with this? I don't know. Uh, and if my institution doesn't know, uh, what do I do then? Um, and I mentioned the thing about licenses. Uh, a lot of researchers are probably not going to know really what they mean. So is there like an English version of, uh, a plain English version of what they mean? Um, this is a tiny point, but one of the things I noticed with, not with Crossref, but with some of the other publishers is uh, when I create tools, it's nice to have proper HTTP status codes. Um, and so this is a real code, 418. I'm a teapot. And it was sort of just included as a, as a fun little thing for developers to play with uh, in the HTTP spec. Uh, but proper HTTP status codes can go a long way. So, um, a little bit of note about supplements. So, supplemental data is a is a potentially great source of data for. Um, I've done a lot of meta, meta analyses myself. I've used a lot of supplemental data, um, but it's it's a huge mess, as anyone could probably admit. Um, the uh, and I know this. Is, I'm not blaming publishers for this. I mean, there's it's you know a combination of things, but. I wonder, you know, could we encourage uh, authors to submit open formats? You know, if they have an Excel file, ask them to submit a CSV instead or convert it to a CSV, um, uh, you know, stuff like that. So it, 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 um, it's a hard problem. You know, it makes it easy to, we want to encourage authors to share data, but it makes it really hard to reuse when there's a huge variety of formats, uh, and, and especially if they're not open. Um, but maybe there, maybe maybe the maybe publishers shouldn't solve it. Maybe it should be a third party uh, that will go around and, and sort of process the supplemental data and make it easy to use. Um, and another thing is about about knowledge discovery. So do do people even know that programmatic tools exist? So we're creating all these client libraries. Um, so what? You know, if, if you know a tree falls in a forest, no one's there. That sort of thing. Um, and so I think we need to do a lot more around education. Uh, our group will try and do more work around uh, cheat sheets and 
screencasts, et cetera, or giving talks like this. Um, but I don't know what else we could do uh, to, to help with that would be great. So we're coming back to Doge again. Uh, I, think, I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, there's great infrastructure that CrossRef is building and other players, data site and Orchid are building. Um, and I think it can make science a lot more awesome. So we have infrastructure. That leads to great programmatic tools. We do have a few things we need to tweak. We need to fix some things. And that will hopefully lead to reproducible science and open science, which I think we all, we all want. Um, oh, my JSON got messed up. But anyway, there's my, my that should be proper JSON if you're interested uh, in, in that. Anyway, that's all. Time for maybe one or two questions if there are any in the audience. Anybody have a question? If not, um, I do. Uh, do you have a sense of um, how uh, often your packages are downloaded, how many researchers are using them and contacting you about using them? Uh, we, we don't have a good sense. Uh, the, the R community hasn't been great about download, uh, accumulating, keeping track of stats. It's getting better. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it hasn't been great, but it, it's getting better, uh, and I think it will continue to get better in the future. And, and obviously with the Ruby stuff and the Python stuff, we'll, I think we'll, it'll be easier to have a good sense of what's going on with the users. Anybody else with a question? Scott? Uh, yep. Uh, Andrew? Uh, yeah. I think uh, when there are more programming tools that are available directly in the web, like you know, IPython and some of the mm -hmm. Cloud9 kind of stuff, do you think um, the programmatic, programmatic APIs will be more used? Well, that is, it's first class clients kind of getting in the way. Yeah. Um, so, you, so you're specific, you mean like they're still writing code, they're just doing it in, the, in a web browser? Um, yeah, possibly. I think, yeah, I mean, IPython and, and the Jupyter, called Jupyter now, yeah, I think that's a great tool and sort of it especially allows people to share. And I think they're working on even, you know, interactively coding in the same 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 project. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, and that, that, that works for R and Python and it's sort of language agnostic now. So that, that I think the tools are already there. Um, whether... Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of things. It's a combination of sort of education, which I think software carpentry and data carpentry are going out and sort of teaching people to code. It's, you know, outreach and telling people about these tools. Um, and, uh, yeah, it just sort of takes some convincing, too. Like, people have a certain workflow, and, and understandably, they're a little bit afraid to break out of that workflow. So I think it's just going to take time. Okay. Well, uh no, I was just gonna say, according to Depsy, your tag size is your, your most used backend. So. Yeah, that yeah. That, so I have a I have a R client called Tax Size that does it uh, works with a lot of taxonomic databases to get people to resolve taxonomic names. So it's sort of sort of like Crossref's resolving DOIs. It's resolving taxonomic names. Um, so two good points brought up. One is Microphone. sorry. So uh, two good points brought up. Uh, one is if you haven't looked at Jupiter, um, uh, 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 look at it. Um, it's about as close as I've seen to what I think is probably going to be the evolution of the, uh, of the paper online. Um, and secondly, um, uh, a project that was just mentioned, Depsis, which is a new project by uh, Heather Puorar and Jason Prime uh, that attempts to calculate uh, metrics uh, of uh, uh, contributions to software. Um, and so it's an interesting way of looking at how important certain uh, software packages are to scientists and to other uh, and to other programmers. Uh, and uh, uh, so, if somebody could tweet it, because it's almost impossible to pronounce. Depsy. Depsy, and that's not going to give you any sense of how to spell it. So, somebody please tweet it. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. Some of the issues with Adobe, right? The PDF files. Um, what's your experience with the Adobe Creative Suite? 
Uh, do you mean with extracting from PDFs? Yeah. Uh, from the PDF. I haven't. I've never used it. Is it is it open or is it a paid? No, this is a you know it's a package that comes with Adobe. Yeah, I mean, I, it may be great. I have no idea, but I think we we try and build around open tools. Unfortunately, I mean, I think uh, part of the reason is because we want our tools to be as available to as many people right. as possible. But and just so, the understanding of how to, to get something working. Right. right. I mean, there are there are. It, I'm not saying it's it's not intractable. There are problems. It's just about making it easy on all operating systems and stuff like that. All right. Um, thank you very much, Scott. Another. <laughs>